we are going to continue our discussion of biodiversity. Um, in the last video, we talked about measuring biodiversity. Um, and in this one, we're going to move on to classification. Okay, so I guess the, I guess the idea would be that once you know, once you have an idea of biodiversity, what do you do with that information? Say, say you find out about all these different types of organisms, what information does that give you? And I guess the idea is that when you start classifying, when you start grouping those organisms that you've found out about, then that starts to give you uh, information about their relationships, how related they are to each other, and you know ultimately that then gives you information about how they might have evolved. Okay, so let's continue our discussion. So in this um, tutorial we're going to talk about classification. Now the classification uh, part has a number of different uh, sections, but they're all linked in together. Um, I hope you can appreciate why I've decided to uh, do this part of the course in this way um, rather than on the board. Um, the other topics have kind of distinct topics that you can cover, explain, and treat as you know more or less separate. Um, but the biodiversity, the themes and ideas are all linked together. Um, so this is what I'm trying to get across here. Okay, let's begin. Um, classification is essentially, if you just if you just think about the the term classification, all it means is to organize objects, um, and you know you might organize those objects based on whatever uh, can, um, um, criteria you wish to. Okay. So essentially what we're dealing with here is if we have a lot of information about different types of species, what do we do with it? Do we just sit back and accept that, wow, there's a lot of variety, wow, there's a, a, a lot of different types of species, that's amazing, that's great. Or do we try and make sense of this variety um, and, and to see if there's any more information than, wow, that's amazing. Is there actually something more to it than that? Is there more structure than we can actually appreciate at first glance? And if there is a structure, what is that structure implying? Okay. Now, classification is then um, essentially grouping things together. But biological classification is when you start classifying grouping when you start grouping living organisms together, okay, based on their similarities in characteristics, okay. Now that's a that's a concept that you will uh, th that you can sorry be asked to state again, okay. So be aware of that. Um, classification is just grouping things together. Biological classification is grouping living organisms based on similarities or differences in their characteristics. Natural classification then is a further, uh, you know, another level of classification where you are grouping living organisms based on characteristics that reflect their relatedness, okay? And this then gives you information about what evolutionary relationship they might have had, okay? All right, let's move on. So the other thing you need to know, like, you know, in, in this general idea about classification is the more specific term, which is taxonomy. This is the study of the principles of classification. That's the textbook definition. In more simple terms, it's the study of the difference between species. Um, that still is a bit cryptic to me. The way I like to think of it is classification is a process. We've just discussed that. Taxonomy is how we are carrying out that process. It's about asking the questions about um, 
shall we shall we base shall we shall we divide up these animals based on how cute they are or should we divide up these animals should we group them based on how many limbs they might have how many digits they might have how many or you know do they have lungs do they have a circulatory system you know shall we shall we group them based on those things or these other things that's taxonomy phylogeny is something slightly different phylogeny is when you start looking at once once you've done your classification once you've put organisms in their different groups and that here i've tried to i you know indicate in this diagram once you have started to put organisms in their groups and you stand back and then you look at what this grouping might imply that then is phylogeny when you put these say if you have three organisms a human a whale and a mushroom you might rightfully conclude that the human and the whale have much more in common than the, than what the mushroom has with the whale or the human so you might put these two in the same group okay now are you doing that based on the fact that you know they these two organisms um, are uh, you know have a circulatory system they they give birth to live young and so on characteristics of mammals if you, you, you doing that based on that is called taxonomy and you may put the mushroom in a different category because it does not share those characteristics that is taxonomy however when you have done that process and then you look at what you've just done and looked at the relationship between these organisms if you conclude therefore that the human and the whale are more closely related than the mushroom and either of those two other organisms that is you making um, making decisions about how related these species are in evolutionary terms and therefore that is phylogeny looking at how closely related uh, different species might be based on how they have been classified that's phylogeny so this is a slightly modified diagram from the uh, textbook um, so i've just added a little bit of information here which might help you make the distinction between taxonomy and phylogeny taxonomy is putting organisms in their different groups based on whatever characteristics you might feel but then when you use that information to decide how organisms might be related to each other these two organisms being more closely related than this one then you then that's phylogeny okay and at these intersection points we assume that there must have been a common ancestor between these two organisms that common ancestor is most likely not around anymore okay okay so let's just have a, another quick look at that then classification taxonomy phylogeny essentially classification is the process taxonomy is how we do that and phylogeny is what information we can gain from that process okay um, we will next talk about if you did manage to classify all the living organisms that we have found so far what would that look like okay when you start to look at all the similarities and the differences between the organisms and you start to put them in their uh, you know uh, separate groups eventually you end up with something that looks like this okay so you have groups that have organisms which share a lot of similarities and different groups which have differences in the, in, in their structure in their in their different features and characteristics now the five uh, you know you'll end up with five groups um, and yes i appreciate that there are domains but we'll come to that later you'll end up with five kingdoms of organisms that you will have to know the properties of and their, their, their characteristics you will be asked or you could be asked 
to identify a particular organism um, based on information that is given to you um, about its uh, features. Okay, so it makes sense to know what what the properties, what the structure of these different kingdoms are. So let's continue that. So the the simplest of them are the prokaryotes. Now um, in in F two one one uh, or at least in some part of your study of AS biology, you should have come across the differences between prokaryotes, uh, prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, uh, between plant and animal cells. So there's some things I'm not going to go into. Um, but uh, of the prokaryotes, prokaryotic kingdom, you know, the main characteristics are first that they have no nucleus. Now, you know, I always consider this a secondary point. The main point being they don't have any internal membrane-bound organelles. Okay, now the nucleus is just another one of those. Okay, so it has no nucleus, it has no uh, membrane-bound organelles. Um, its DNA, it's not organized, it's not linear, and it's not, you know, in, in, in chromosomes that, so, you know, in, in the way that we have them, that, or at least eukaryotic cells have them. Um, their DNA is, you know, uh, yes, it's it's two strands of DNA, but um, the two ends of those strands of DNA are joined such that it's a circular piece of double-stranded DNA. Okay, if you can imagine that. Uh, the other thing is that eukaryotic cells have um, proteins bound to the DNA to uh, help it um, coil up and you know have, have its more condensed form and also help to regulate which genes are active and which are not. Um, but prokaryotic DNA is not associated with with proteins okay uh, Prokaryotes also have different types of ribosomes they are smaller and respiration occurs in structures called mesosomes made of membrane. Uh, so their so their outer membrane kind of folds inwards a little bit in these structures. So technically, it's not uh, an an internal um, organelle. Okay, and obviously they don't have mitochondria, so respiration happens in these other structures called mesosomes. Okay, and prokaryotic cells are much much smaller than eukaryotic cells. Okay, so our five kingdoms are there. We've just looked at the prokaryotic one. Um, and now we will look at the protists or the protoctists. Okay. Now these are eukaryotic. Um, they are mostly single-celled, but not all. They show a wide variety of forms. So, you know, um, if you look at um, animal cells, that, you know, most animal cells will all have very similar characteristics. Most bacterial cells will have very similar characteristics, but protoctists show a wide variety of forms. Some of them have plant-like features and some of them have animal-like features. They are free-living um, and they can be autotrophic or heterotrophic. So you know, a very kind of ambiguous group there. It's very difficult to define them. And you might find that the best way to identify them is if you are having trouble um, identifying them, okay? So, or classifying them. So let's just look at these two examples. Okay, um, we have uh, an amoeba here. And we also have um, uh, another protoctist called Euglena. Okay, so let's just have a quick look at the the, the two of them. The amoeba uh, doesn't have any kind of outstanding features. It has a nucleus because you know, it's, it's a eukaryotic organism. Cytoplasm it has got a contractile vacuole. It's got mitochondria. Um, so nothing outstanding there. If you look at the euglena, uh, it has 
a flagellum, okay, it has a chloroplast, it has no cell wall. So these are, you know, a kind of very odd combination of characteristics there. You've got a chloroplast, which, you know, uh, generally you, you would tend to think that they belong uniquely to plant cells, but not so. Um, they've got a flagellum, which uh, can occur in eukaryotes uh, and prokaryotic cells also. Um, so, and, and no cell wall. So a chloroplast, it's got chloroplast, but no cell wall. So when you have these co kind of combinations of characteristics that you don't think really fit in either of the other kingdoms, that's your clue that you are looking at a protoctist. Okay, and apologies if I can't be any more specific than that. Okay, so let's move on then. Looking at our kingdoms again, the next one we're going to look at is the fungi kingdom. Okay, now as we go through this, you might find that we are getting more and more complex. Okay, now there's obvious implications of this. But I don't want to have to spell that out, okay? This kind of thing should be kind of coming across to you and you should be making your conclusions based on that. Yeah? So now, so we were looking at single-celled organisms, uh, prokaryotic organisms, then we started looking at eukaryotic organisms, but they were mostly single-celled, but they had then internal organelles, okay? Eukaryotic the pro protoctus. Now we're looking at another group of eukaryotic cells, but this time um, they can be multicellular, okay? So we are slowly increasing in our complexity. So fungi are eukaryotic, i.e. they have their internal organelles, nucleus, Golgi bodies, mitochondria, etc. Okay? Um, they have a cell wall, but it's made of a carbohydrate called chitin. Um, the cytoplasm is multinuclear. Now, this is a kind of strange concept. So if I just zoom in on, on this. Now, the structure of a fungus usually, but not always, is that their cells are linked together. So you don't have free cells separate from each other. You have cells which are linked together in these chains called mycelium. And if we zoom in on one particular part of that, we find that it looks kind of like this. So you don't have cells kind of separated from each other in the normal way. This mitochondria is primarily, you know, in this cell, as it were, in inverted commas. But through the gap in it, you know, between the cells, it could easily just flow into this area. Um, so the this is what we call multinucleate, okay? We're not really looking at separate cells in, in the classical definition, okay? And these structures are called hyphae, okay? Or, or one is called hypha, many are called hyphae, okay? Um, other things, they can be saprophytic, or they are saprophytic, which means that they release enzymes that cause the breakdown of organic matter. We would actually see that as the as the breakdown of, of dead material. Yeah. Um, but that breakdown is happening because the fungus is releasing enzymes, digesting those complex molecules into simpler ones and then absorbing the products. Okay, so I hope that that has clarified certain things about them. I just wanted to spend a bit of time talking about the kind of different forms of fungi you might get. Let's leave the unicellular fungi on one side for now, but um, just like we said, those mycelium could be, um, you know, forming these kind of branched spheres. Yeah, it's basically just uh, branches of cells in their hyphae forming these mycelium. Okay, and this is called a filamentous fungi, or uh, it might be something that we see um, like this. So, um, for example, a mushroom you could be looking at. Now, if we, if we were to zoom in on its internal structure, essentially it's the same thing. However, it's separated into the hyphae, 
are going into whatever substrate the fungus is growing on, but the uh, another part of its structure is is this reproductive uh, structure, uh, sometimes referred to as a fruiting body, um, and that's what we see on the outside. Okay, so it's got the hy hyphae down there and up here. These ones are responsible for getting its nutrition, and on the upper surface, this body is responsible for its reproduction. Okay, and that is the fungi. All right, so just remember what makes them unique. They are eukaryotic, they have a cell wall of chitin, that's their unique feature, I would say, and they have cell bodies called, so, sorry, they have bodies made of mycelium, which are essentially strands of cells, but these cells are not separated from each other in, in a way that we, you know, we are kind of more accustomed to see. They have these separations or connections between the cells called septa. Okay, so now let's move on to the next kingdom. And if we're looking at, you know, if we're increasing in complexity, you should be able to predict what the next kingdom is going to be. So next we have our plants, and they again are eukaryotic. They are multicellular. Um, they have a cell wall, but this time it's made of cellulose. Um, other unique features are that they, well, this is not a unique feature, but they have multicellular embryos, which, you know, this is something that makes it different from fungi, at least. They have multicellular embryos from fertilized eggs, okay? Um, and they have autotrophic nutrition, which, um, specific to plants, it is photosynthesis, that's how they how they do that. Okay. Moving on. We have our animal kingdom. Again, these are eukaryotic. Again, they're multicellular. However, this time they have heterotrophic nutrition. They have to get their chemical energy from 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 the ingestion or digestion of other organisms. Okay. Be it plants or uh, other animals. Um, they have fertilized eggs uh, that develop into balls of cells called a blastula, and animals can usually move around. Okay, and that's our that's our five kingdoms. But we will revisit the restructuring of this um, in, to include the domains. But we'll come back to that later. Okay, so I, I guess the the big idea here you know, in the context of our uh, bigger unit of classification or, or topic of classification is first we discussed how we carry out the process but now we are actually looking at if we do carry out that process what do we start to get? We start to get the structure of five kingdoms this um, then gets subdivided further and further but let's move on to the next topic, okay, which is um, classification as we know it now. So if we continue that process, so let's just take a, just a quick step backwards. We first, all the organisms that we know about, we they can all fit into these five kingdoms, okay? Then, if we look at further differences within each group, okay, we can further subdivide. So if we have um, animals, for example, they might be further divided into these animals have this certain characteristic, these animals have a different characteristic, so we can subdivide this animal kingdom further into other groups. And if we look at what those groups are, um, we will, you know, we can see that we have our uh, kingdoms here, so we have the plant, animals, fungi, protoctists, and the bacteria, okay? <clears throat> um, if we look at the animals, they are subdivided into, if I can read that, you might not be able to, but they are subdivided into 
different types of organisms that share certain characteristics. So, for example, the Nidarians, they include species such as the jellyfish and corals that don't have um, bilateral symmetry. Okay, so they're kind of, they have a kind of an circular spherical organization of their body. But other organisms are different from that. They have a bilateral symmetrical organization, which means they have a you know, a, a head end and a, and a tail end, as it were, okay? And this is a, a very basic kind of distinction. Once you have the, all the organisms that have a bilateral symmetry, i.e. I have a head and a tail end, then you can further classify these into ones that have um, a vertebral column and skull arrangement, i.e. the, you know, vertebrates and the arthropods having an exoskeleton, okay, so, and then you can further classify these, and so on, and so on, okay, but we're still working within the general framework of the five kingdoms, with each kingdom, uh, we're just discussing these animals as an example, okay, um, further, further subclassifying based on certain characteristics, and this, you know, the equivalent thing will be happening within the fungi kingdom, within the protist kingdom and within the plant kingdom and so on. Okay, what does that look like? Sorry. What that looks like... I will just do that. Sorry about that. Okay, anyway, here we go. So if we do that, you know, we get a, a kingdom of lots of organisms, and then the subdivisions are, are given certain names, okay? So, for example, you have, uh, if we're looking at the rose, for example, now the rose obviously is a plant, so it belongs in the kingdom plant, plantae, or plants. It's phylum is angiospermae, so it's a flowering plant. Its class is, is it, is a dicotyledony, i.e. it's a dicot, it's got, you know, when it germinates it's got two leaves um, instead of one, and so on, okay? So with each subgrouping, the number of individuals in that group gets smaller until we get to genus and then finally species where there is only one. So, so within the species, all these organisms are so similar that um, they can interbreed with each other and produce fertile offspring. There are some situations where this distinction is very difficult to make, for example with bacteria. But let's put that to one side for now these organisms are so similar that they are classified as being the one species, okay? Um, yeah, so you will have to remember, now you don't have to know um, all the different types of phyla, all the different types of class, all the different orders, but you do have to know that the, the general hierarchy of classification follows this system of domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, okay? And as we go down that hierarchy, we're getting more and more specific. Organisms get more and more similar to each other, but fewer in number until finally with the species there is only one. Okay? <clears throat> Let's move on. All right, guys, so that was classification, um, you know, putting into practice the principles that we were talking about, um, that essentially when you have an organism, you look at its structure, you look at its features, and based on which features it shares in common with other organisms, you put it in, in that group of organisms. If you carry that process out, you get your kingdoms, your large groups, but then you can further sub 
categorize them into smaller and smaller groups which have more and more in common with each other and therefore you have the classification system for all the way from domain to species. Next we're going to go on to how to name these organisms. Um, I kind of see that as a bit of a side note on the topic so I'll just put it here to one side. Okay. So how we name these organisms, um, we use a, a, a system of Latin naming. Um, the main reason for that is that you know, in, in different parts of the same country, you, you'll get um, an organism referred to with different names. Um, it, similarly, you'll get uh, this, uh, uh, the same organism named different things, i.e. its common name, um, in different countries and in different languages. And in some cases, you know, different species will have the same common name. So all these things lead to a, a very kind of confusing situation, especially when, you're, when you want to talk about an organism and you want to be specific that this is the particular species I'm, I'm talking about. You need to be able to identify it um, you know, uniquely. Okay, so for that reason, we have the binomial system of naming. Um, and that system of naming um, works like this. So, for example, if you have this organism uh, called the striped mullet, that's its common name, but its scientific name will be done using the binomial system, which incorporates its genus and species. So it's related to the system of classification that we were talking about. Remember, the, the last two groupings, or taxa, were the genus and the species, and that's what we use to name the organism. Okay, it's in the Latin language, but you know this is kind of used as a international standard, yeah, which means that regardless of the country, regardless of the you know of the place in the country, a, you know a scientific uh, reference to this organism will be made using its genus and species, and there there will be no ambiguity about it. Okay, um, right. The other issue that comes up is <clears throat> identifying the organisms. So um, once you once you can once you've defined what a species is and named it as such, um, you know you need to be able to identify it also if you come across it again. Now, you know. This is important in you know, our day-to-day -day lives because certain species are endangered and in order for them to be identified as an in, you know, oh, this species is endangered, this species is not endangered, we need to be able to observe it and based on its characteristics say, okay, this is so-and-so organism, okay? Why is that relevant? So this is just one example that, you know, um, certain new developments will only go ahead if they 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 are found not to in you know cause any harm or in, endanger any species. So for example, this is the great crested newt, uh, not its scientific name, um, but uh, in in this country it is uh, you know a protected species. It only has it only survives in a you know a limited number of habitats, and therefore wherever it is, you you cannot um, develop in that area. Um, so this was one case in point. You can read more about it if you uh, find the link to the Prezi. You can open that and you'll you can use the link here. So how do we then identify? These species, okay. Um, one method that we use is called a dichotomous key. So if if you really don't know a lot about the organism, 
you can follow a set of uh, questions, a set of uh, prompts. Um, each question has two possible answers. So following these, you know, simple yes or no questions based on making observations of, you know, a certain organism, you can then identify which species it is. Okay, so for example, um, let's say we are looking at B, all right? So I've just gone out into the field, I've found this organism, this plant here, and I now want to know what species it is. Okay, so I have this dichotomous key that I can follow. Dichotomy meaning, you know, two double-sided, therefore, you know, two questions, yes or no, dichotomous key. So, are the buds paired? Yes, they are. Yes, go to question two. Are the buds black? No, they are not. Go to question three. Are the buds green? Yes, they are. Yes. It's a sycamore. Scientific name, Acer pseudoplatinus. Lovely. Okay, so by making an observation, by following the, the, the questions and answering the questions based on my observations of the organism using the dichotomous key, I have identified the species of organism. Yay. Okay, so that's that. Okay, that's identifying living things. It's based, you know, on the general principle of classification and naming living things, but that, as I said, I consider that to be a kind of side note. Not, not that that means it's any less important, but, um, you know, uh, it's kind of a side note on the bigger discussion of the themes of classification and evolution, okay? So let's move on then. Our next and final topic is going to be on modern classification. We classify our organisms, we group them together based on the similarity of their features. If we do that, you know, we get some big groups where they share a lot of features, but we, we keep on subgrouping based on, you know, more and more uh, unique features and subclassifying, and we get domains, kingdoms, phylum, class, etc. until we get one unique species, okay? But the one of the main themes of this unit, sorry, of this, um, this particular topic within the module is the idea that, you know, our, the way we classify changes based on the knowledge or based on the information that we have at any one time okay because we are you know we, we're essentially trying to make sense of a lot of information and at some point we might do it wrong um, but you know we we only have so much information that we are able to get at a particular time when we get more information we might have to reevaluate how we've grouped organisms and you know, slightly modify how we've been classifying things, okay? So let's now look at one instance where that has actually happened. It has actually happened right from the start of the classification system that, you know, Carl Linnaeus originally devised. It's been, it's gone through a lot of subtle modifications as we have found out more information, okay? So let's now look at modern classification, okay? Now, the, the idea here it, it, you know, I, I just I just said it right now, just now, that you know Aristotle is 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 the guy who is attributed to have you know started to think about groups of organisms and you know the, the features that they share. So um, he made this classification system very simple, very primitive. Um, not really his fault simply that, you know, at that time when he was alive, we didn't have as much information um, that as much as we do now. We didn't have microscopes, we didn't have biochemical techniques. And so the amount of information that we had to us was simply on observable characteristics, outward structural features, um, 
you know, wouldn't even have been aware that there were microscopic organisms around. Okay, all he could see were that there were plants and animals, and you know, within the plants there were small, medium, and large ones, and so on. Okay. Um, right. So you know, at this time, during Aristotle's time, he made these classifications based on the information that he had at that time. But as we move on, and as we get more information, uh, we can um, make more distinctions between organisms. So um, with the advent of microscopes and you know, more detailed investigation with the, you know, with the ability of humans to explore different parts of the world using boats, etc., finding out about more types of organisms, that gave us a lot more information, and based on more information, Carl Linnaeus then came up with this idea of five kingdoms and grouping organisms in those kingdoms and phyla and so on and so on. Okay. So the idea is that you, you can only classify as well as or as accurately as the information that you have at your disposal. Okay, so one example would be um, these two organisms right here. You know, hundreds of years ago, if a scientist was to look at a fungus and a plant, he might notice very many similarities in their structure. Yeah, so you know, they both have um, parts of their body or parts of their yeah, parts of their body that goes underground, um, apparently to gain nutrition from there, possibly, and both have structures uh, above the ground as well. Okay, so if you're looking at that, you might classify these two as being in the same uh, group. Okay, but it's only when you have more information microscopes, etc., that you can see more detail and then you can say, wait a minute, these two structures, i.e. these and these, are there to perform slightly different functions. And this is, you know, not performing the same function as this. So they are different and therefore they are likely to, you know, be in different groups. Okay? So that's, that's the idea here. Whoops, what did I do? Okay, that's the idea. Okay, so, moving on then, so far I've only talked about the five kingdoms, but what we are kind of moving towards now is what information did we get that made us change from the five kingdom system to something else, to something newer, okay? And what that information was, was the development of you know, the fields of biology that were called biochemistry, i.e. the study of proteins, and molecular biology, i.e. the study of DNA and RNA and their sequences, okay? Up till a certain point, we didn't have any idea of these molecules and what they represented. But once we did, they gave us more information on how to classify organisms. So just like Linnaeus, sorry, just like Aristotle didn't have the information that Linnaeus did, Linnaeus didn't have the information that we have now, okay? Right, so let's move on. What was that information and how did it change the classification system? So we were able to then discover um, bacteria or organisms that we thought were bacteria, very similar to them in, you know, in outward features, single-celled, very small, um, didn't have any nucleus or internal uh, organelles, um, so we classified them as bacteria, but there were a subgroup of these that, um, you know, survived in very extreme conditions, high salt conditions, high or you know, very high or very low pH, extremes of temperature, and they were using molecules that, you know, other bacteria couldn't. So there was a kind of hint that maybe, um, you know, these organisms that we were calling bacteria weren't 
bacteria, but might be something more. Now, analysis um, of the molecules of these, uh, you know, so-called bacteria, so-called prokaryotes, well, they are prokaryotes, but, you know, so-called bacteria, showed that they had some very different features from all the other bacteria, okay? So, for example, um, this diagram shows lipids of um, archaea, archaea, so this is the subgroup of the bacteria, um, versus bacteria and eukaryotes. So, bacteria and eukaryotes have lipids like this, okay? Um, the fatty acid is joined to the glycerol via an ester link, an ester bond. But in archaea, this subgroup of uh, prokaryotes, they had a different structure of lipids. Now, the structure of lipids is similar in all other organisms, except the archaea. So this is, a, you know, a very in, you know, a very basic difference, a very uh, critical um, difference between, you know, from other organisms. So their membranes were different because of this. Okay. Secondly, um, RNA polymerase present in you know all living organisms. You know all all the clearly living organisms. So we're going to exclude discussion of viruses at this point. But all living organisms have you know have RNA polymerase. So it's a very critical molecule. But bacteria have a different RNA polymerase to the the RK bacteria, okay? So, you know, what, so what we were previously classifying as prokaryotes, you know, they, within them, there was a big difference, okay? So some of these organisms that we were calling prokaryotes and grouping together with bacteria had a very different structure of RNA polymerase, had very different lipids, and so it, it couldn't be justified that these organisms could be in the same kingdom, okay, could not be justified. And at the same time, even though they had so many similarities with eukaryotes, ultimately they didn't have any internal organ organelles either, so they couldn't justifiably be put in the eukaryotic domain either. So the archaea these subgroups, that, that subgroup of prokaryotes, were then separated from the other prokaryotes. These were then called bacteria. The, the, separate, the separated group of extremophiles, they were called the archaea, and separated from the other kingdoms, which all made up the eukaryotic uh, domain. Okay, so... Let's just recap then. Why were these archaea, archaea or archaea bacteria? Why were they not the same as bacteria? First, they had differences in their structure of lipids, and that obviously meant differences in the structure of their membranes. They had differences in the structure of their RNA polymerase, and they also had differences in mechanisms of DNA replication. Okay, so this is why. This group of organisms could not be, uh, you know, be, could not be classified as a, you know, technically a prokaryote because they were clearly different. Also, they had many similarities with eukaryotes. Some of these are that they both have DNA-associated proteins. Remember, we said that um, prokaryotes or bacteria have naked DNA; they don't have any associated proteins, but archaea bacteria do. They have a similar RNA, sorry, that just said RNA polymerase, RNA polymerase to eukaryotes, and they have similar mechanisms for DNA replication. Okay, therefore they, you know, they were misclassified really as, you know, being bacteria. They are a separate group of organisms called the archaea. So now we have uh, a slightly different structure of classification because of that, and that's what we'll look at next. Okay, so we have established that 
um, our simple definition of prokaryotes, uh, classification of all um, prokaryotes as being the same was not good enough because there were critical differences in their biological molecules. Okay, lipids, RNA polymerase, mechanism for DNA replication, different between um, some within the group, within the kingdom of prokaryotes. So we've separated these organisms out that have these different types of lipids, different RNA polymerase, and we have called them archaea. Okay, so now we have three groups, bacteria and archaea, which were formerly grouped together. And we have still have all the eukaryotic kingdoms, i.e. Um, the plants, animals, fungi, protoctists, they are all still there, but they are now contained within the bigger domain called eukaryote. Okay, so what does that look like? It looks like this. Nothing very different. We still have our one, two, three, four uh, eukaryotic uh, kingdoms, but our prokaryotes are now separated into the archaea and the bacteria. So we now have three domains, archaea, eukaryota, and bacteria, and our eukaryote uh, domain still contains the plants, animals, fungi, and protoctis. So nothing drastic. It's just that based on new evidence, what we formerly classified as a kingdom of bacteria is now separated into two um, domains. And we've grouped all the four eukaryotic kingdoms together into the one eukaryotic domain. So we've got three domains, and then we've got the kingdoms, phylum, class, etc. Okay, so um, one question I've seen come up a few times is, you know, what's the, what are the differences between the three domain and the uh, five kingdom classification system? It's a bit of an odd question, really. Um, but here are some points, some valid points that you can make for that. So based on the evidence, the prokaryotes are divided into two domains, bacteria and archaea. The other four kingdoms form the third domain, eukaryota. Five, the five kingdom system was based on, you know, observable features, but the three domain system is based on further evidence provided by um, biochemic, biochemistry and molecular biology, sequences of amino acids and proteins and sequences of bases in DNA and RNA. For example, you know, the amino acid sequence of proteins, now, you, you know, it can't just be any protein, proteins which happen to be present in a very large number of organisms, those are the kind of proteins that you can compare to find out how related these organisms are. The more sequence similarity, the more related the organisms are, because there's fewer mutations happened to change their sequences. Okay, so cytochrome C is... Uh, one of the essential proteins of respiration, and since all living organisms have to carry that process out, it makes sense that we can compare this in all organisms to see how, how, how similar the sequence is for that protein. And similarly, we could compare the genes of these organisms, we could compare the DNA sequence, i.e. the sequence of nitrogenous bases in the DNA, or the RNA sequences. Okay, And that, guys, that wraps that up. That was modern classification. Essentially, it's us having new information, so us restructuring our classification slightly to account for that new information that we had. Okay, But it's, it's I guess, just an example to tell you that you can only classify um, you know, based on the information that you have. The more information that you have, the better you can classify, and that's always the case, not just in this example, it's always been the case all throughout, you know, the history of classification. Whenever new information has come up, the system has been changed slightly, okay? Now, you might think of that as a kind of, as, as classification as a kind of artificial system, you know, 
um, nature is nature. Who are we to put organisms in these groups? But you can't think of it like that. Okay. We are looking at the similarities between these organisms and finding that there is a natural order in this huge variety of species. Okay. And that's what we have to ultimately accept that we are not just putting groups, we're not just putting species into groups based on, you know, uh, our whims and, you know, whatever we like, but we are actually trying to find out about what the natural order is, what the natural structure is in, in, in nature, okay? And that natural structure eventually has to um, point to the fact that, you know, all these organisms, I mean, look, if we just look at this diagram, yeah, you can look at it as domains, kingdom, phylum, class, etc., and then the individual species. But what if you looked at it from a different point of view? What if you looked at it from all the different species going backwards through time, going backwards and backwards and backwards? Ultimately, you know, the number of branches get fewer and fewer and fewer. What does that imply? Okay. It implies what we're going to talk about in, in my next video, which is the process of natural selection and evolution as, as a means to go from few organisms to very many, um, you know, via gradual change over many millions of years. Okay, ultimately, uh, that's what I think classification is there to kind of guide us on is that if you classify properly based on you know proper taxonomic principles um, then you do eventually come to the you know the unavoidable conclusion that evolution has occurred to generate all these different types of organisms which you know happen to be adapted very well to their natural environments okay guys so that's what we'll do next and I'll say good luck and I'll see you in the next video.